My name is Joe Peroni, and this is the Rise Above Project. And today I'm going to answer the question, are men being trained by society to become codependent? Now, I know that there's a ton of information out there about women being codependent, and that's to be expected. Uh, society does want women to be nurturing and to be caretakers, so there is a correlation to women being codependent. But I think that there is plenty of information out there on that. I've been working with a lot of young men that are going through a lot of difficulties, and I think they need this type of information. Now, if you're a woman out there, this might be some good information for you as well, especially if you have a son, and then it would be really great if you could stick around and, and listen to the information that I have. So how am I gonna do this? What I wanna do is I wanna take a look at what codependent symptoms are, and then from there, I want to go to the societal expectations of men, quote unquote, men. Then from there, I want to add a, a cautionary tale. Now, if you don't like a personal story, I understand that. And so you can jump out at that point. But the reason why I'm going to give you the cautionary tale is, is because there's a lot of young men out there and they could do the research on this stuff but they don't see it as a real thing. So it might be better if they could hear a story from a, an older guy that has been through all the trials and tribulations of being a young man and going through this codependency that is fully endorsed by our society. And in some ways I've come out the other end. So I think that would be beneficial for men but if you don't appreciate personal stories, I understand that. You can just jump on to another show at that point. So let's take it from the beginning. Let's look at the codependent symptoms. Now, there's, there's a lot, and they do change depending on who you're talking to and which literature you're looking at. But let's just take some of the basics. So number one, do you allow yourself to be taken for granted? That's, that's one. Number two... Do you caretake and do you fix others at the expense of yourself? And when we're talking about at the expense of yourself, I mean, are you doing it emotionally? Are you giving up too much of yourself emotionally? Are you doing it uh, too much physically? Are you working too much at the expense of yourself? You're not sleeping because you need to earn enough to earn the right to be a good man, to be in a relationship, this type of thing. Is it financial? Are you making up the difference for another person in your life because they're not, they're not meeting their bills? So now you have to pick up the slack. Nothing wrong with that, but if it's an overburden uh, to you or it's being expected of you, or again, you're allowing yourself to be taken for granted. Do you take responsibility for other people when they should have accountability for themselves? Are you enabling them? Do you rescue other people? And some of the biggies here. Do you deny or ignore your own feelings and needs? And this is very difficult because we start this very young with boys. From earlier than preschool, right? We're looking at three, four, five years old. We're already telling boys, you can have a feeling of, of, or an emotion, maybe, but even if you did, you're not allowed to express it. And what goes on here is that as this young boy turns into an adolescent, turns into a man, you're putting him in a situation that there's a really good chance he's going to allow himself to be abused or neglected. Why? Because he doesn't have emotions, feelings, and needs and desires. Because he's there to be a tool for somebody else. And that's what our society teaches. Now, if anything I say here is causes you to be defensive or you're trying to figure out a way that what I'm saying is not true, you're part of the problem. Plain and simple. Because this is the way men feel. Now, I know that there's a, a difference in generations. There's a big difference between boomers, Generation X, and what we're seeing today in millennials. And I, I get that. However, a lot of the young men that I talk to they still feel this way, even if they're, I talked to 18, 19, 22 year old young men, and they still feel this way too. So if you're 
try and figure out a way to make this that it's wrong, that we don't do this to men in society, you gotta check yourself because you're part of the problem. You're part of what's forcing this down men's throats. Let's continue. If you're a man or a, uh, a young man, do you help others or give to others in an unhealthy way? In other words, too much of yourself where you have nothing else more to give. Do you assume responsibility for somebody else's happiness? This is a big one. We're going to talk about this as I go through the show. Do you apologize unnecessarily? Do you say nothing in order to keep the peace, to deal with somebody who might be emotionally dysregulated, or because of the thought, you're supposed to take care of them? You're not allowed to have a need, so therefore you just be quiet or just apologize just to smooth things over because you're not allowed to have an opinion. So let's put that to the side. Those are some of the symptoms of being codependent. Let's take a look at some of the sayings and adages that are out there that people just expect to be true in relationships or in marriage. So here's the first one. We all expect this, we all think it's funny. Happy wife, happy life. But what does this really mean? It really means that it's the man's responsibility to take care of the woman's feelings and emotions. That's the very definition of being codependent. So are we teaching codependence? Simple answer is yes, absolutely we are. Let's take it to the next degree. Because when we say happy wife, happy life, what we're really teaching here is we're teaching abuse. All right? We're teaching abuse in the relationship and we're saying it's okay. And we're teaching that it's neglectful to one of the partners, which is the, the one who's trying to make the other person happy. So let's take it to the next step because this gets even worse. If mom's not happy, then no one's happy. What does this mean? Once again, we have the first part that says the woman doesn't have responsibility for her feelings or her life, but the man does. So he has to take over. Again, are you being overly responsible for somebody? Again, the very definition of codependence. But the more disturbing part here is that if mom's not happy, nobody's happy. The connotation here is, is that we are green lighting. We are saying it's okay for a woman to be literally, verbally, or possibly physically abusive to her children or to her partner just because she's not feeling the way she wants to feel. That's a problem. We need to talk about this. But if men grow up with the thought that it is their responsibility, we're teaching men to be in abusive relationships. We're teaching men to neglect themselves. We're actually teaching men from a young age to have complex post-traumatic stress disorder in their relationships. Continuing, let's talk about couples counseling for a second. There's a very well-respected couples counselor. I'm not gonna say his name because I'm not here to hurt anybody in any way. I just wanna deliver the information and if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. But I'm gonna read exactly one of the things he says. And this is a quote. Again, well-respected couples therapist. Your job as a man is to make sure that she does not need another man. All right, let's break it down real quick. Okay, number one is we all have jobs in this world, but I don't think being in a relationship really should be considered to be a job. Is it your job? So now we have, if you... Don't make enough money for her. She's going to pine for another man, so that's your fault, so you need to work more. Or if she wants to have sex twice a day, you, you have sex once a day, that means she might want another man. That's your fault. So everything, again, becomes your fault as a man because a woman has a need that you can't fulfill. And if she's not happy, God forbid, right? Like you're, It's your responsibility. As a couples therapist, this is ridiculous and it's insane. If you want to have a happy relationship of any sort, a marriage, partnership, whatever you have, the easiest way to get there is to be as an individual as happy as you can be or fulfilled. 
And then what you want to do is you want to try to choose a partner in your life that you're not going to rescue, that that partner is also happy or fulfilled or as much as they can be, and they're that way in their life. And what these two people can do, they come together and they share their happiness together. That makes sense. But here we have over and over again, couples therapists actually saying that it's a man's fault for not making their, their partner happy. As a marriage and family therapist myself, what I see time and time again, again, not always, nothing's 100%, but enough that you can talk about it, is that I'll have a couple come in. The wife will say, the reason why I'm here or we're here is because I'm not happy. I'll ask the men, why are you here? Well, <laughs> she dragged me here, that's number one, but then they'll say, I'm here because my wife is not happy. And so the one thing that they do have in common is that they both believe that the wife's not happy and both of them should try to figure out why she's not happy. And once again, we have a man sitting there in quiet desperation with no needs, no desires, no emotions, no feelings, just there as a robot to try to figure out how to make her happy. Again, codependence at its best. When we look at marriage and family therapy today, or actually all of psychology, it's about 85% women are in the field. And so obviously there's a feminine bent to the field now. Of the other 15% or so, I would say about half of that, 7.5% are very effeminate men, or they're taking the capitalistic side that says that they don't really get paid as much if they don't satisfy the woman. Because if you don't satisfy the woman, she's not coming back as an individual, which women coming in is most of your clientele. Or if a couple comes in, a man will sit there and take it. And he will try to do better and better and better. Whereas the, the woman, if she doesn't feel like you're on her side, she'll quit. And then they both leave. And so you have that part of it too. So you have roughly, I don't know, 90% 90, 90 is basically being feminized. And they're not teaching, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not teaching good psychology. What they're trying to do is they're trying to make money off of the emotional dysregulation of women. And the expectation that women, quote unquote, deserve what they deserve. Now, men are easier to please because they believe more in the type of uh, the Pareto principle, 80-20. If a man's in a relationship and 80% of the time things are going well, 20% they're not, men expect things to go up and down like a roller coaster and not always be perfect. We're trained like that from, from birth, that things are not going to go well, you expect things to go bad, you try to fix them, you troubleshoot, and you're a solution-focused person, but things typically go wrong. Right, like if, if somebody flies a plane from point A to point B, what are the chances of things going wrong? Well, it seems like things go right almost all the time, but the potential for wrong things to happen is always there. And there's thousands of potential wrong things that could happen. And so as men, we understand that and we try to figure that out and fix it. Whereas on the other side, it seems like, well, if there's some unhappiness here, he's not making me happy. So got to ditch the relationship. The numbers show that about 80% of Divorces are filed by women. If a woman has a college education, we're looking about 90% of the time they're jumping out of the relationship. Does that mean that women are unhappy in the relationship and men are happy? No, it just means that men are more willing to work on it, <laughs> right? I mean, so let's, uh, let's move on from that. I can, uh, I can talk about that all day. Let's talk about the societal expectations of quote unquote being a good man. And let's run through them. Again, I know they change throughout generations, that's true, but for the most part, we can generally agree that these qualities that I'm gonna give you are what's expected of a man. Being a provider, being a protector, being the breadwinner, being overly responsible, being stoic, not emotional. Uh, maybe you can have emotions, but don't let them infect anybody else in any way. You shouldn't burden people with your stuff. You can't complain, you can't cry, you need to work tirelessly through your problems. Uh, again, no needs provides for others. Okay, that's the basic thing of being what you would call a strong man. 
And once again, the difficulty here is, is that men can be in a relationship and if you ask them, are your needs being met? They'll look at you like you're crazy because they don't even know that they were allowed to have needs in the first place. And again, this puts them in a position where they're going to be, or there's a potential for them to be in a situation where they're allowing themselves to be either neglected or abused in some way. I think beyond the shadow of a doubt, I think we can look at this and say that there is no way somebody could think that our societal expectations of men doesn't lead men to be codependent. And the difficulty with that is, if you have a man and you say, to be a good man, you can't have your own needs and you have to take care of somebody else's needs. Well then, the next part of that is, to be a better man and then a greater man and the greatest man means that you have to have zero needs and to be able to take care in the highest way. So the more manly you try to be, the more sick and the more abused you get. It's an interesting concept that I think it needs to be talked about more. The reason why it's not talked about that much is because again, therapy now, the whole all of psychology is almost completely feminized now and nobody wants to talk about it. But I have plenty of young men that I help on a daily basis that need this information and I'm gonna give it to him. So let's talk about a cautionary tale. And it's very embarrassing to me, but I'm gonna do this, because this happened over 30 years ago. I probably never would have talked about this because I think it has the potential to maybe hurt some people. But there's been so much time that's passed, and I think now would be a good time because it's good for teaching. And I really wish, when I was a young man, that I had somebody to look me in the eye and talk about these types of things that I'm gonna talk about right now. So if it could even help one person, I'm ready to go and do this. Back in the day, I got married. I was young. I was idealistic. I wanted to do everything right to be a good husband, something maybe that my father was not. So that was it, I'm gonna be a good man, I'm gonna do everything. The girl that I married, she wanted to have more of a traditional type of wedding and that included all the bells and whistles before you get married. I don't even remember what all those are. There's like rehearsal dinners and all this stuff. At some point I felt like a prop and that she wanted the she wanted the wedding, but not necessarily the marriage, right? Like that's the first thought. Like if I had a man in front of me saying, Joe, how do you feel? That I would have said that. I would have said, I, I'm not feeling like anybody cares about me. <laughs> I feel like I'm a prop. But I didn't think about that, that nobody asked me and I didn't even know how to have emotions and feelings back then or my own needs. But looking back on it, yeah, that's what I felt. I felt like I was not even part of the picture. Did I feel loved in any way? No, <laughs> but I wasn't expecting to be because that didn't matter that much, I guess. So let's talk about the reception. Again, I was trying to do the right thing. Everybody wanted this reception. My soon-to-be wife wanted a reception. So I ended up paying for the reception. Back then, I think it was about $5,000 to do, which was a lot of money. Um, did it include like carving ice sculptures and all this xylophone players yes because she wanted it and the family wanted it so I did it I didn't know back then because there was no Google it's not and I didn't know anything but if you want a traditional marriage it's the bride's family who pays for the reception I didn't know that so that's the one of the other things where I got screwed on is because I didn't challenge the the bride's family is that I'm the one paying for it and yet Traditionally, they're supposed to pay for it. So that's where I hurt myself as well. Again, not allowed to complain, so I guess I didn't. Now, how did I get $5,000 back then when I basically made minimum wage? Well, I did everything possible that a man would do. Overly taking responsibility, ignoring all of my needs. Uh, again, didn't care about myself emotionally, physically, or financially. So one of the things I did was I gave up my apartment. I lived with my father so I could save some money. 
Then I sold my car because after we were going to get married, I figured we were just going to move to Las Vegas so I didn't need a car. So I, I sold my car. From there, I knew I was going to, for a couple of weeks, live in my wife's uh, parents' basement for a while to save, not to save money, but I didn't have a place to go after the wedding. There was no real place to go. So I did all that. So again, part of codependent behavior. Are you allowing yourself to be taken advantage of? 100% yes. And that's why this is so many years ago. I'm still a little embarrassed by it, but now would be a good time to talk about it to help other people. So I did all this. After the reception, there's an expectation that you're gonna get money back. So if you spend 5,000, maybe you get more than that back. That didn't happen because, well, it doesn't matter what reason, but I got about $4,000 back. Now I'm in the basement with my wife at the time and her two parents. They're undoing the envelopes. I'm being taken advantage of. I didn't want that to happen. I thought that should have been between me and my wife, but I'm not a complainer and I'm a man. It's good. We're going to deal with this. So they take the money out. What they do is the father takes half the money, $2,000, puts it in another account for her just in case we get divorced. So now I'm down to $2,000 that I have to split with my wife. So that gives me 1000 if something happens. From there, we end up moving to Las Vegas. Now, between airline tickets between, I didn't have a car, so we had her car. We had to ship it across the country. She was able to put all of her clothes in her car. And I did not because I'm a man, so I have no need. So there was no clothing of mine in there. So I had one luggage. So now <laughs> I've got no car. I've got just a luggage, uh, one piece of luggage with some clothing. And we go across the country and we fly, we get to Las Vegas to start this new life. From there, with all that being said, I end up with about $300 in my pocket and no clothes. So I went from having some money in an apartment and a car to nothing. And I felt like I'm doing really good as a man. I'm giving everything I've got. There's no way that she's not gonna love me. And the whole point here is everybody was like, well, just be grateful that she liked a poor man like you because women like rich guys and you're not rich. So, I mean, just be grateful the fact that she even likes you at all. Because remember, love is conditional. And so you have to meet these markers in order to be loved. And you didn't even meet all those markers and she still wants to be with you. So be grateful. Very embarrassing. So as I, I would tell guys out there, come on, like this is ridiculous, right? As it goes on, we get to Las Vegas, I get a job. I'm working from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. She's depressed because she's not around her family anymore, so she stays home and she gets depressed. Within like six months, she stops wearing decent clothes, she gained about 30 pounds, and she's making long-distance phone calls to her parents every day. Now from here, back then, it's not like cell phones where this is cheap, phone calls. You're talking about long-distance phone calls back then, so it was about $100 a week that she was spending on these long-distance phone calls. If I had the conversation with her that she's spending too much money on these phone calls, then of course I'm not a good man and I'm, I'm not providing the safe place that she needs to be able to express herself with her parents and I'm getting in the way of her family. So she didn't get a job. So then from there, I ended up getting a second job. So I worked from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. Then my next job was from, I think it was 3 p.m. to midnight. So. I was working from 5 a.m. to midnight, and then, then from there I get home about one o'clock in the morning or so, and I'd have to be up by four. So I was getting three hours of sleep every night, working all of those hours, and she was being depressed and spending the money. Now, when I say their phone calls are $100 for these long distance calls, understand, but back then I was making somewhere between four and five dollars an hour, so it took me 20 to 25 hours per week to pay off her phone calls. But of course, I wasn't allowed to have an opinion, and I was the bad guy. <laughs> really interesting. So we end up going to a marriage and family therapist at the time, and it became exactly what I tell you that's happening today. Joe's not doing this, he's not there for me, he's not emotional, he's not affectionate, he's not nice to me, he blah, 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 blah. All of this, all on me. So I said, hey, let's put this in the middle a little bit. Let's go to the local, there's a church near our apartment. We go to the church. 
The priest, I don't remember the verse, but the priest did say something about when a man and woman get married, they're together and they're supposed to separate from the family and then they're supposed to serve each other. The wife serves the husband, the husband serves the wife. Just her hearing that is that, that there might be some responsibility on her end. We walked out of there. She said, we're never going back. But churches have great services and they're free. But she wanted to go to a paid therapist that I had to pay for to basically hammer me and tell me how bad of a person I was. Now, going back on this, I remember at some point thinking, I really want to be a marriage and family therapist one day. Because as I was sitting there, it never occurred to this particular therapist or any of the other ones that we've gone to, I think we went to three, is that they never asked me how I felt. They never asked me about all of the stuff I gave up in order to make her happy, that I was never once thanked, I was never once validated. It was all about her depression, her feelings, her emotions, her starting over when I was starting over too, with the extra burden of taking care of a woman who didn't want to work. And I was only making minimum wage then, so I had to get two jobs. So none of this <laughs> am I angry about. None of it I'm bitter about. It's just that over time, I want to use some of this to make sure that people understand that at that time, I thought I was being more and more manly by doing this, by being able to take more. It's like, I can work more, I can suffer more, I can eat less to save money. I can do all of, excuse me, I can do all of these things in order to give her more. And that's not the way it should be. All human beings are human beings, right? Like, it's not like a man is supposed to take over everything for a woman and make them happy. That can't happen. And so I would say out there, use my cautionary tale, as embarrassing as it was, as I was thinking about this to do this show, about how bad I was and how little that I actually cared about myself, or I didn't even know to care about myself, or how shameful I thought it would have been to not have done these things. Because if I would have said no to any of this, it actually would have been on me as a negative. In other words, if I said, listen, I don't have the money for the reception, or no, I like my apartment, I'm staying here, and so therefore I won't be able to save the money to do that. No, I'm not going to get two jobs and get no sleep. You're going to start working, right? Like any of those things seemed almost too overly aggressive, like you're not allowed to do that. So let me end the show right there again. The question to start off, are men being trained by society to be codependent? I would say 100% yes. And if you're a man listening to this, if any of this resonates with you, take it, try to learn from it. If some of it doesn't resonate with you, that's okay too, throw it away. Not everything's gonna be 100%. And I understand that. If you're a woman listening to this, try to listen to this without being defensive because it's not like uh, this happened in, in a vacuum, right? This is typical of men going through relationships and what's expected of us. I know it's changing now, and that's actually a really good thing. I have men now that say, I wanna be with a woman that actually has a job. Is that okay? I want a woman who can take care of herself. I say, Mr. Peroni, is that okay? <laughs> I'm like, yes, it's okay. Put that on the top of your list if you want. It's all right, especially in this generation now, 2024, it's become more normal to do that. But back in the day, it wasn't. But those negative things still are lasting today. Hopefully, this was uh, helpful to you in some way. My name is Joe Peroni. This is the Rise Above Project. Please subscribe and tell a friend. Thank you.